was a request Afghanistan is literally invincible we're gonna get into that before we do there's a thanks button on the channel you can donate you don't have to subscribe if you'd like to and anything else just give me a thumbs up a lot of people seem to not like my opinion on some things but it is what it is we all move on we all move forward all right let's get into this one of the funniest ways for a megalomaniac country to screw itself over is to invade a curse region that should really be left alone. A good example is Vietnam, the homeland of guerrilla warfare. Another example is the Caucasus Mountains where only the insane kings go to wage war. Of course, how can we forget about the country that recently humiliated the living hell out of America, the most powerful country of all time? Let's set sail to Afghanistan, the notorious place known as the Graveyard of Empires. <laughs> the Pamir Plateau is considered the roof of the world. Imagine all these giant, gorgeous mountains sprawling out from the Pamir Plateau. These mountains in particular are called the Hindu Kush, which literally means Hindu killer in Persian. Ah, the euphoria of getting demonetized. How stupid am I? I thought when they talked about the Hindu Kush, I thought that was a, like a tribe. Oh, Chris doesn't pay attention. It's from the very first video. The Hindu Kush saw all sorts of early civilization. This region, birthplace to one of the oldest existing religions in human history, Zoroastrianism, was ruled by the Persians from the ancient days. Buddhism also thrived here when it was introduced a few centuries later. After Alexander the Great's conquest of Persia, a Greco Indian kingdom was born from the chaos and was a perfect environment for Gandhara art, a hybrid of Greek culture and Buddhism. With the introduction of Islam, Buddhism was effectively eliminated from the region. A lot of ethnic Turks soon flooded the place, but the uncompromising Persian descendants just refused to be evicted. No matter how wildly the winds of cultural change howled around them, they retook their homeworld, generation after generation, century after century. In the 11th century, these territorial people were named Afghans, and the land that they lived on, Afghanistan. Yup, this region is now permanently cursed for empires. The 13th century is here, and with it comes the mighty Mongol invasions. The Khorasmid Empire was one of the early victims of this serial killer of civilizations. The last Shah of Khorasm, Jalal al-Din, decided to make his last stand against the relentless Mongols, here in Afghanistan. Surprisingly, he was able to completely teabag the fearsome Mongols here by abusing the impenetrable steep mountain terrain in the Battle of Parwan. The Khorasmid Empire was inevitably brought down to its knees, but even the Mongols had to rage quit and leave South Afghanistan unconquered after such an unpleasantly traumatic experience. Throughout the years, many foreign powers have tried to rule Afghanistan, from the Timurid Empire to the Mughal Empire to the Safavid Empire. Understandably, the Afghans didn't take kindly to foreign powers. During the Safavid Empire, the Afghans started such a successful rebellion that they even conquered their captors after humiliatingly overthrowing them. After years of back and forth chaotic warfare, the Afghan based Durrani Empire finally took control of the region. This is when we can start seeing glimpses of modern day Afghanistan. The Pashtuns, the majority race in the Afghanistan we know, are direct descendants of the Afghans. Meanwhile, in the north, Russia was an emerging superpower, desperately wanting to join the enticing party of imperialism like the other cool Western countries. It was doing everything in its power to find an ice-free port. If Russia wanted to sail on the open seas, it was forced to either pass through the Ottoman Empire to reach the Mediterranean Sea, pass through Siberia to reach the Far East, or conquer Middle Asia to reach the Indian Ocean. But there was this one small country with a somewhat strong navy that was willing to embark on a global harassment campaign just to prevent Russia from expanding any further. The British Empire. It persuaded the Ottoman Empire to blockade the Russians in the Mediterranean and the Japanese to blockade the Russians in the Far East. Now, all it had to do was block off the Indian Ocean. Unlike other regions where Great Britain was more than happy to persuade other countries to do the dirty work for it, it wanted to take matters into its own hands and prevent Russia from going anywhere near its golden goose, India. The Russian forces have already conquered the north of Middle Asia. There was no more time. Britain decided to attack Afghanistan, establish a pro-British government, and meet the Russians head on. 
The Baraksai dynasty recently overthrew the Durrani Empire to establish the Emirate of Afghanistan. Britain used the whole I return this country to you, the people, as justification. I'm using the old Bane. Oh, Batman. Oh. to start a war. Although Britain was able to take Kabul and Kandahar while toppling the Baraksai dynasty with relative ease. Remember this, even if it's the one thing you take away from this video. The actual war in Afghanistan starts only after it's been conquered. In the snowy winter of 1841, a massive rebellion snowballed in the steep, harsh mountains. The Pashtun warriors were excellent snipers in this terrain. These warriors would fire outrageous pot shots from ridiculous cover with these insultingly outdated matchlock rifles that have been rendered obsolete in Europe. Just to give you an idea of how un- Look, they might have been outdated, but if they still fire some sort of uh, ammunition that can kill you, and it hits you, it can kill you. Doesn't matter if it's outdated or not. Imaginable this was given the technological differences. Imagine a malnutrition Gandhi bludgeoning the ever living shit out of Mike Tyson with his peace stick. The 700 British soldiers and 3,800 Indian mercenaries were massacred in the Hindu Kush during a maddening retreat against an invisible, laughing enemy. The British attempted to desperately negotiate for peace, asking only for safe escape in return for surrender. The Afghans promised, Sure, we understand. Of course you can leave. But proceeded to merrily hunt the retreating British regardless. An additional 4,500 soldiers and 12,000 civilians were buried in the Hindu Kush. What remained of the terrified British fled Afghanistan, but returned in 1878 with 40,000 soldiers. The death of Shah Sher Ali, who went to request aid from Russia, left the Afghans confused with no leader. This time around, the war ended with a British victory. The British experienced the terrifying Pashtun warriors firsthand and arbitrarily split the country up into two with the Duran line to cause an internal divide within the Pashtuns. This way, they'll be too busy fighting each other and the British could adopt Afghanistan as a protectorate. The British, rather understandably so, no longer had any interest or confidence whatsoever in the direct governance of Afghanistan. They just wanted to leave the lethal natives right there as a buffer against Russia. Good luck getting past them. Jesus Christ! Poor Russia was blockaded from the Mediterranean due to the Crimean War, humiliated in the Far East from a costly war against the Japanese, and exhausted from pointless wars against British proxy nations. Russia finally agreed to formally acknowledge British rule over Afghanistan, and instead chose to split up Persia with the Anglo-Russian Convention. Peace didn't last long. Immediately after the British Iron Fist started to slip following the First World War, there was another rebellion in Afghanistan, this is the third war between Afghanistan and Britain. Britain, already in tatters after World War I, had no choice but to liberate Afghanistan in the following year of 1919. Good riddance. You can fight a war anywhere overseas, but if you're going to hold on to the territory, that's where the problem arises. Like England forming the colonies in, the United, in America, and then the war prolonging from 1775 to 1883 it just became a guerrilla warfare and it became a no matter how hard the British try to win they'll never throw that knockout punch that will make the Americans just surrender because as long as the, the Americans can pick up a rifle shoot at a British soldier and then go back to his life which is what happened in Afghanistan as long as you can do that you can prolong the war and if you're going to prolong the war, you're making that country drain expenses. And after a while, you know, you just get to, I don't want to have our boys over there at war. You know, you just get to that point. And that's where you win. That's because, I'm, you guys hear that siren? I've been here all day. You shut your face. No, and, you know, unless you're planning on invading a country and then, taking over the whole thing, just committing genocide, just eliminating everyone, and then restarting that country as Afghanistan 2, which nobody in the world would allow someone else to do. Unless the country's planning on doing that, then you're committed 
to long supply lines and having to send soldiers over like it's in the end it's just not worth it so almost in a way the war itself wasn't worth it you know what i mean it's Finally independent at last, the Afghanistan Kingdom had a straight 40 years of unprecedented peace, progress, and reform under Shah Mohammad Zahir. As soon as the age of imperialism drew to a close, the stage was set for the Cold War. Unfortunately for Afghanistan, the Soviet Union was looming over them to the north. The Turks of the North were already fully indoctrinated with communism, happily absorbed as a member of the Soviet Union. In 1965, the intoxicating whiff of communism was spreading from the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. In 1973, a pro-Soviet royal, Daoud Khan, dethroned the king in a coup. Five years later, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan executed Daoud after another violent coup. Afghanistan became a full communist state. Crazy timing, really. The exact same year, the neighboring country of Iran was plunged into chaos with the Islamic Revolution. Afghanistan has to take some inspiration from that, right? The infamous anti-communist Islamist guerrilla group Mujahideen started a civil war immediately upon birth with a bang! Now the Soviet Union wasn't very happy with all this Islamism nonsense spreading next to its pure communist comrades. They tried to support the Afghanistan military by deploying military advisement groups, but this was a pathetic fart in the unstoppable tornado of Islamism. So, the Soviet Union decided to start a frontal invasion of Afghanistan. Their KGB assassinated the president as soon as the war started, put a new puppet government in power. Seems like a pretty efficient way to end the war, right? Remember, the actual war in Afghanistan starts only after it's been conquered. A puny change in government doesn't stop the Mujahideen. The Afghanistan home ground advantage was just so outrageous. The feared Soviet tank battalions that served them so well during World War II were rendered completely useless by the steep mountain, forcing them to abandon all their expensive equipment and march on foot instead. Well, without the cover of their armored vehicles, the Mujahideen again pulled out their insultingly outdated matchlock rifles and went on a merry killing spree against the 20th century superpower, just like their ancestors did to the British a hundred years ago. As the culminating point was reached and the Soviets were forced into the slow bleed of a stalemate, they didn't even know where or even who the enemy was. America gleefully makes the problem several magnitudes worse following the age-old wisdom. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Remember how Britain split the Pashtuns in two with the Duran line? Half the Pashtuns are still technically living in Pakistan, but they don't really care about borders here. So, America just drops massive amounts of weapons into Pakistan to kindly raise the difficulty for the Soviets to absolutely fucking brutal. After nine full years of flushing unimaginable amounts of money and human lives down the toilet of Hindu Kush, the Soviets completely withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989 without anything to show for it. Two years later, the Soviet Union collapsed. I have to assume that they would have lasted at least a few more years if they didn't screw themselves over so terribly in Afghanistan. This, my friends, is the background for where the Taliban starts. There was an abundance of war orphans to choose from due to the frequent civil and international wars. The Taliban would take them in, radicalize them, and train them to be their cult soldiers. These guys took over Kabul in 1996 and then overthrew the Afghanistan government. They declared an Islamic Republic and executed the president in public to prove a point. Ruling with unforgiving Sharia law, all female schools in the country were merrily laughed out of existence within 24 hours of the Taliban taking power. Oppression of minority groups and other religions were an everyday occurrence. They went full fundamentalist and started banning whatever they wanted with full impunity. In 2001, they even kindly gifted a massive fuck you to their fellow Muslims by blowing up this 1,500-year-old Bamian Stone Buddha through an act of ultimate trolling, leading to a rather understandable loss of support from other Muslim countries. In September of 2001, you know. Did they blow that up because they viewed that as going back to like Muhammad, pre-Muhammad days? 
when people would pray to uh, idol um, idol stones uh, idol worshipping and stuff like that so they blew that up in accordance with what the law went with that like that makes sense to me but at the same time it's like I don't was anyone going there to pray to it I don't know you tell me This is the year that the incident happens in America. You know this story all too well already. America was furiously out for blood and justice for the blatant attack on their soil, doing everything possible to find the person responsible, Osama bin Laden. Conveniently, the Taliban was sheltering him. America asked calmly, Hey, can you hand him over please? Or else. For context, even North Korea was pissing its pants and screaming to anybody who would listen. Yo, this isn't me, man. Uh, I, I know I've done some messed up things in the past, but it really isn't me this time. Please, man, you gotta believe me. The Taliban, for some reason, tells America to kindly fuck off. In October of 2001, an outraged, bloodthirsty America invaded Afghanistan. To be fair. The Taliban saying that if Russia or China or England or something like that, like something happened on their soil and it was Bill Gates or um, the Amazon guy, Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos had something to do with it. And those countries, is he American, Jeff Bezos? Yeah, he is. I almost said Elon Musk, but I know he's South African, I believe. But let's say one of those countries said he was, you know, in charge of it, hand him over. The United States would absolutely say no. So I get Afghanistan saying no, whether he was born there or not. I get it. The Taliban, it's their way of saying no. This is, this is, he's here for whatever reason, you know, but no, we're not, we're not handing that over. I get that. I do. I understand that because I know the U S would do the same thing in that situation. I, I would like to think the United States would hand that person over, but I, they're powerful enough to say, no, what are you going to do about it? You know what I mean? No matter how harsh the terrain of Afghanistan may be, if the strongest military really wants you dead, you're dead. Within a month, the Taliban was annihilated. But, and there's always a but, you know what's coming next. Say it with me. The actual war in Afghanistan starts only after it's been conquered. And this is also where the US screwed up as for every country. You come in, you and you power through, and then just like United States did, mission accomplished, war's over, and it's like it's really not though. The war's over, we'd be leaving and coming home. It's not over. And I think a lot of countries who've done this easily get sidetracked because maybe they win overwhelmingly at first. But that's when and I'm sure it happened to the US. All the other countries start funneling in money and weapons to fight that enemy. And so, you know, and it's just a mistake I think a lot of countries make. The US does too. The American weapons so cheerfully donated for the purpose of fighting the Soviets were now aiming straight back at the American soldiers. Unlike America's initial expectations, the newly established democratic government wasn't doing very well and bin Laden slipped through the cracks. Furthermore, America also declared war on Iraq in 2003, which only added more chaos to the maddening that was completely stupid. Cacophony of confusion. The new government to replace the Taliban was too corrupt and incompetent to win the hearts of the Afghan people. To make matters unimaginably worse, another radical terrorist group of an equal headache size as the Taliban called ISIS entered the stage in the 2010s. All this combined left Afghanistan a complete and utter clusterfuck with no clear solution whatsoever. 
After about 20 years of war, the traumatized America decided to finally call it quits and negotiate with the Taliban for a phased withdrawal. Uh, do the Taliban and ISIS not like each other? I, I don't, I wouldn't think they do, but I'm just curious because I thought uh, people said most Muslims hate ISIS because they're so extreme. So what is the Taliban? I was very blown away when I first watched a video on the Taliban. I, I respected them immensely how they started. So I'm just curious if that is something that they just don't like. In essence, the whole thing ended up like the Vietnamese War, where needless blood and money was burned for no clear gain. In 2021, the Taliban smoothly made their long-awaited comeback as if nothing ever happened. Which megalomaniac country will next fall victim to Afghanistan, the cursed region that always gets the last laugh against the most powerful empires of its time? Some are guessing that it's now China's turn. North Korea, 100%. That line that the British drew to split up the Pashtuns is a modern border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. See this uh, narrow stretch of Afghanistan territory extending east? Yeah, that's called the Wakhan Corridor, and that's China touching borders with Afghanistan. Right there. Afghanistan under Taliban rule, robbing borders with the oppressed Islamic population of West China. We can only imagine what's gonna happen next. Good luck! If it's not North Korea, which, um, let's be honest, it's not gonna be. It's probably gonna be the Sentinelese Island, North Sentinel people. I can see them, they've had enough of Afghanistan. Just always fishing near them I mean Afghanistan clearly is is uh, you know they have uh, an ocean side <laughs> so you know it's definitely gonna be this Sentinelese Sentinel I, I keep saying Sentinelese I think they're Sentinelese people North Sentinel Island whatever it's gonna be them old friend we'll end this video with a prayer for peace and coexistence in Afghanistan, but we might be a few centuries too late for that to happen. This has been David Bradford from Knowledge. With friends like Mussolini, who needs enemies? <laughs> cancer team. Did Hitler have cancer? My secret superpower. Other mammals can't see this color. What? Red? Cancer team? What is happening? Why is this? Why am I getting so sidetracked by this? I apologize. All right, this was Afghanistan is literally invincibly. All right, that was interesting. It's very good. I liked it. Sorry I didn't get to it earlier. I thought I put it on the list, and then you asked me about it. I checked and realized I did not put it on the list. I'm sure that I mentally. Hey, are we done? Shut your faces. I'm sure I mentally put things on the list, but then I forget to actually put them on a list. So I apologize. All right. Hope, oh, jeez, I almost unpaused the video. All right. So I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, have a good day, have a good night.